When there's no more room in hell, Treboros will walk the- Other hell. Hey! Been a while. Since the game apparently slipped into a coma and just stopped updating, I've had to ration out my video ideas and take a small break while giving DE a bit more time to get a mainline out. Maybe they managed to get it out, maybe they didn't, I don't fucking know, but I'm making a video anyways. This is something I've been wanting to do for quite a bit. A tier list for all the frames. This is going to be similar to Brozyme's grading list that he did in the past, but the specific purpose of this tier list is to directly compare the frames, rather than giving them grades individually for their own potential. Which is a bit ironic, since I think comparing the frames is a bad idea if you want to have fun with the video game. Sure, you can play a Meta Beast frame if you want, but... I mean, your operator can handle most mission types if you build it properly. Still, comparing the frames is necessary to figure out who is the best of the best. So, let me unveil the list layout, and as you can see, we have some notes here on the right. Make sure to get a grasp on these, as they're going to be the pillars on which the frames are rated on. Lastly, a few things to note. Regarding arcanes and whatnot, I will be considering them to an extent, but the main goal here is to isolate frames to just what they alone are capable of. We wouldn't be getting anywhere if folk could just be like, oh, but Arcane Fuckbutt exists, you know? Obviously, Arcanes are important and super strong, but that kind of goes without saying. Also, frames in the tiers aren't being ranked in a specific order. In other words, frames closer to the left of the tier aren't any stronger to the ones to the right of the tier, and vice versa. So keep that in mind. Lastly, this is going to be split into two videos for a few reasons. One, the video would be way too long if I tried to make it into one whole chunk, and two, it lets me make changes to the tiers based on comment feedback on the first part. Right, so enough bullshit, let's go. As with any tier list, there must be a rock bottom. And unfortunately for fans of Goku, Wukong is being placed in Wukong tier. Okay, so why the hell is Wukong being given his own tier? Well, the simple answer is his entire kit does nothing to benefit missions, or they get completely and entirely dominated by other frame abilities. The number one argument for Wukong is that he cannot die. And, and sure, that's fair enough. Wukong could probably take an entire nuclear arsenal to the face and just think he got bit by a fucking rabbit law. But the problem with that is that if your main and almost entire focus is just survivability, you're not in a good place. Tanking in this game is not the traditional type of tanking that we're used to. There's no inherent value to the team or to the objective for being able to survive. This game isn't built around beefy players absorbing damage while other players are DPS and blah, 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 blah. Tanking here is purely for your own sake. So because of that, survivability should be a secondary or tertiary focus for a frame. Unfortunately, Wukong does tanking almost exclusively. He has little damage potential, no buffing potential, no debuffing potential, no CC, nothing that helps his team or his objective. He can't even do wide DPS well. His one is amongst the weakest if not the weakest of the ones that scale off of melee mods. Frames like Gara and even Korra have better ones. Defy is his only saving grace, so I'll give him that. Hell, Wukong is probably the tankiest frame in the game. But Cloudwalker is a candidate for the worst ability in the game, and it has not aged well at all. One of the best perks of invisibility is being able to take advantage of melee damage bonuses that you get from being undetected. Shame that Wukong can't use the big fucking stick he's known for in this form. Not only that, but he's slow as hell and he doesn't even need it to survive. Again, DEFY exists! And if you really need invisibility for mobility, we have operators for that now. And lastly, Primal Fury has a deceptively short range, which is sad as hell considering just what the hell the powerful should be capable of. The damage output isn't great, its base stats aren't great, and since melee can't go through walls anymore, it suffers from that too. So with every other frame that I am going to be covering, even the ones in low tier, they will have something that benefits teams and or objective completion. But Wukong has nothing. The only thing Wukong can do is exist. I cannot find any other frame that is on his level of bad. So, Lord hoping, he gets a massive rework. Okay, now we're moving on to low tier. And the first we'll talk about is Atlas. Now, to Atlas's credit, his one is a pretty solid damage dealer with decent area of effect, and he has a nice CC. 
but sadly he's outclassed by other frames and whilst he does have a lot of armor, his survivability isn't as great as other frames that are similar to him. Rock walls are okay, but outside of body blocking enemies in Index, I'd rather have something like a Vault since he can place more of his shields and you get damage bonuses from shooting through his. Petrify is pretty decent and it even increases the damage that enemies take by 50% but it could have a better effect. A blind CC would work much better in regards to his one, and additionally, Petrify prevents enemies from taking status effects, which is unfortunate for the team. Rumblers are also kind of useless for the most part. They can't do much damage, and they don't have any additional aggro generation to make them viable for aggro pulling. Next is Banshee, and Banshee might be a surprise to those who are like me and use her exclusively for shit like Jupiter Io. So let me explain. Banshee has two major focuses debuffing enemies with sonar and building for resonating quake. But both roles have got some problems. She does offer big damage numbers for enemies affected by sonar, but here's the catch. You also have to target them in the correct area. That is a reason why she's ranked lower. Many damage dealing abilities can't take advantage of sonar unless the weak spot appears on the torso, which is where most damage abilities target so allies can't take advantage of it very well in a number of cases. Another thing holding her in low tier is that there's another frame in high tier that does a very similar job to Sonar, but with the added effect of a CC and it working for more damage dealing abilities as well. Soundquake with its augment is pretty damn solid for low level enemy clearing, giving her a niche use in that regard, but it does quickly weaken after level 30 or so. Banshee also struggles with survivability thanks to a lack of a hard CC, so she's hampered in that regard as well. Hey, editing trip here, popping in for a quick clarification. I'm aware that Banshee's Soundquake unaugmented is quite good for total map lockdowns, however Banshee is unable to do anything while she's in this lockdown, so it's limited to being a stall CC. The effect is nice, but there's other frames with CC that can completely lock down areas, but still be able to act. Next on the list we have Ember, and woof, Ember has fallen since her nerf. But look, there's a reason why Ember isn't in Wukong tier, she can still function. I mean, look at this, this isn't terrible or anything. She can still do what she was doing before her nerfings. It's just that Ember's entire shtick is waltzing through an area and just killing everything with minimal effort. But with just one caveat, you're only really able to do this at low to medium level ranges. In higher level missions, she quickly becomes less appealing because she doesn't have much in the way of scaling damage. She has some multiplicative power, sure. What you usually do is throw out Accelerant then activate World on Fire, but enemy levels quickly overtake her. The issue with Ember, is that DE decided to make her main role be a low-level trash clearer. Ember was already not in a good position simply down to her scaling problems and her survivability, and the nerfs sure didn't help that. Nerfs which decreased the effectiveness of World on Fire's range as well as its energy consumption. But the big reason she's in this tier is that believe it or not, killing low-level mobs isn't just an Ember thing. Plenty of frames can completely wipe the floor with low-level enemies with super minimal effort just like her. That's not difficult. You can take something like an Oberon and hit his 4 and kill level 40 trash with one go. You can take a Frost, press Avalanche, and do the same thing. And these frames aren't even designed to be direct damage dealers. Almost the entirety of Ember's kit, however, is meant for damage in some way, shape, or form. DE assumed that balancing a frame to be a low to mid level trash clearer would be a good idea, and thus they decided they could nerf her as long as she worked within that role still. That is an incorrect assumption, DE. Ember needs to be more than that. Next on the low tier, we have Nyx. Even after a rework, I don't believe Nyx is anywhere good as what she should be. Mind control still isn't very good for a damage dealing minion, especially when you consider things like Equinox's Metamorphosis Augment being a far better improvement. DE is still struggling to get minions to be a viable source of damage, seemingly because they let enemy armor values get way out of control. Psychic Bolts is certainly better, being an armor stripping ability which does help her minions or chaos, but a big issue is that it's limited to just six targets. She can't throw it out again unless they're dead, or she resets the marked enemies, essentially making Psychic Bolts a worse version of Seeking Shuriken. Chaos is just as finicky of a CC as always, yet in many ways this is Nyx's most viable ability. It's a CC that causes enemies to target each other, but they can and will still target you, making it unwieldy and not nearly as good as hard forms of CC that always affect enemy targets equally and consistently. And Absorb is one of the worst tank powers in the game. Most Nixes use it with the augment, but with how slow she is and how much energy it eats up, 
I'd rather just be playing, well, any other frame with survivability in CC. Next on low tier is Revenant. Revenant can best be described like this. A four button and a sea of four buttons that are better. That about sums it up. His thralls are actually pretty damn solid aggro pullers as they have heightened aggro generation. Just a shame they died to teammates in Revenant's most valuable ability. Also, the guises they leave behind do jack diddly for damage because of the almighty armor value that enemies have. Mesmer skin is a decent survivability tool, but it can be eaten away pretty fast by even low-level trash mobs. A chunk of Reeve's use is largely wasted since there's a number of things in regards to using it on his thralls. But again, his thralls never stick around for longer than a few seconds especially thanks to his allies and his four. Dance Macabre has a stupid energy cost for how underwhelming it is compared to other frames with wide damage dealing fours. The damage falls off with range due to the splitting of the lasers, it's blocked by walls, and you don't even get the full effect unless you burn a shit ton of energy for the boosted variant. Sorry Revenant, I had big hopes for you but you're just not very good. Next, we have Titania, and I already described Titania's issues in detail in the Nyx and Titania rework video, but I boiled it down to, Titania is a step below being a jack-of-all-trades frame. Her forms of CC aren't consistent, her buffs from Tribute aren't anywhere near as good as what they should be, and she struggles with survivability. Her 4 is a solid damage dealing power though, but its raw DPS is beaten out by other frames. I'd go into it more, but you can hear more in the aforementioned video. Two more frames are in low tier, and second to last is Valkyr. Valkyr was actually a pretty damn strong frame for a good chunk of the game's life. Though, through a combination of nerfs and simply the game's natural evolution, she has fallen off quite a bit in terms of viability. Ripline is mostly just a toy at this point. As a movement tool, it's not very useful, certainly isn't on enemies, and while Paralysis is pretty nice for opening up enemies to finishers, it doesn't have much more use other than that. The core reason she's in low, however, is Hysteria not being as good as what it once was. Along with the Energy Drain increase nerf, she's also not truly immortal anymore. But what's also an issue is that Hysteria lacks range to make it compete with other exalted weapons, and this is a problem in general with melee weapons. It's why whips and polearms are currently the meta, as range is a super important factor in this game. The damage on the claws is good, but she can't spread the damage out very well. But there's one thing that keeps her from the abyss of Wukong tier. Warcry. Not only is Warcry an attack speed buff for her allies, it also slows down enemies, buff her and her allies' armor, and slows down enemy attack speed, meaning it acts as a damage debuff for enemies as well. Warcry alone is what keeps her head above water, but it's not enough to move her past anything but low tier. And lastly, in low tier, we have the bird herself, Zephyr. Alright, so Burb is good for two things. Turbulence and Tornadoes, though the last one is a little bit finicky. Her one is mostly just a movement gimmick, and Air Burst's entire point is buffing Tornadoes. It's so one-sided, I'm surprised they didn't just perma-buff Tornadoes' range and give her a different two, but hey, it is what it is. And Tornadoes is a little too gimmicky and situational of a crowd control. It's in a similar situation to Chaos. The Tornadoes wander around, so its actual quote range isn't very consistent. A perk, though, is being able to shoot into the Tornadoes to deal damage. Which is neat, but because of the inconsistency of the Tornado's path, it's not exactly a solid power. Uh, again, sorry to the Burb fans, but hey, at least she's fun though, yeah? Now, we're into mid-tier. And we'll be starting off with Ash. Ash at his core is a pure raw damage dealer. That is what he lives for, that is what he do. And the damage he puts out is certainly quite good. Ash has a nice perk in that he's capable of fucking up armor in a plethora of different ways. Be it through his numerous bleed procs, his shadow clone damage ignoring armor outright, his fatal teleport augment, or his seeking shuriken augment stripping armor. So his damage potential is incredibly high. Not to mention his survivability is decent as well, so he scales up pretty nice. But what's holding him back from high tier? Well, it's mostly a combination of his selfish nature and his setup time for his damage for just average coverage. Ash offers no real buffs to his team, unless you count his smokescreen augment, but Ash already has so many good augments to begin with that it's kind of difficult for me to fit it into a build. Another issue is the setup period he has for dealing damage. If he's built for seeking shuriken, he has to set up the shurikens. If he's using teleport for kills, he's limited by finisher animations. If he's using his four, he has to mark all 
all of his targets manually multiple times, then release the Shadow Clones and wait for them to do their thing. Ash has one of the longest setup times for any of the wide range damage dealing frames, and it doesn't help that he's hindered by the line of sight requirement of his 4, and even though Ash is a specialized frame, I don't think he's good enough at his role to truly be pushed into high tier. It's mostly down to his setup time to damage ratio. Next is Baruch, a rather new frame, though I do feel confident putting him into mid tier. He has a super far reaching CC that also lingers, which is nice, but it is weak in the sense that it requires line of sight. His 4 is also a strong, strong DPS ability, specifically for taking out trash mobs. Not only that, but it scales pretty well into high level missions. It has a solid crit chance, the waves go through walls, the waves have a base range of 20 meters, not bad all in all. He has some nice survivability as well, so he's a pretty good DPS CC mix, which also grants him good mission coverage. Baruch, however, is limited to mid tier, specifically because there's a frame in S tier that, in my opinion, is just a better Baruch. He's also not in high because of the issues with his CC. Not only does it require line of sight, but it doesn't even sleep enemies immediately. Most CC abilities take hold the instant they hit the field, so this is a pretty bad thing to have on your CC power. If it didn't have this issue, that alone would likely put him into high tier. But his 4 is also held back by his restraint gauge, and many would argue that it's not strong enough to warrant the restriction, and I would have to agree. But for what Baruch does offer, I do think he is worthy of mid tier. Now we move on to Hydroid. Hydroid is notable for his ability to cover the map in multiple different forms of CC. He has his Tempest Barrage that can have multiple instances, he has his Tentacle Barrage, he has his Puddle, etc, etc. So that's the main place where Hydroid shines. If you're in something like an Interception, he can throw Cannonballs on one point, his Tentacles on another, more Cannonballs elsewhere, and even use his Puddle form to defend another point from far away. He also has some nifty damage potential as well, such as using Corrosive Barrage, then pulling enemies into his Puddle for some pretty solid damage. And of course, he has loot potential with his Tentacle Swarm Augment, which puts him a bit higher into the mid-tiers. However, Hydroid isn't much higher simply because there are better forms of CC, and while he can use multiple instances of CC to cover larger areas, there's some frames who have CC radii that are so huge, they don't even need to put the effort into using multiple different instances of CC. All they do is hit the CC button, and bam, the area is covered. But, as with the description of mid-tier, Hydroid can still do his job, and he's still rather unique in his loot increasing capabilities, so he rests firmly in mid. Next, we have Korra. So, while DE did end up failing to make Korra into the Beast Hammer with a powerful summon that many of us were expecting, Korra did fall into a gameplay style that does make her pretty decent. It mostly boils down to this. Put Venari into heal mode, set up her shingle domes in areas where enemies congregate often, and stare enemies in the domes, then whip the domes. There you go. It turns her into an area of denial damage CC frame. I'd say her biggest issue is that she's quite the energy hog if you play her like I do. Since I like planting domes and whipping the enemies inside of it to spread damage amongst the entire dome, it can eat at her energy quite badly. And also, Venari's only real good mode is heal. Disarm is trash and attack mode has a cooldown and can't hit multiple enemies. But she did eventually fall into a role for me, and she works. Next up, we have a veteran of the game, Frost. Frost is pretty simple at his core. He's the defense guy. He's the guy who protects Terminal or Cogger or whatever the hell else, and he's one of the best at that. He's such a simple frame that it's kind of hard to talk about. I mean, most folk know how to play Frost. You press the snow glow button, but he's also pretty good at CC thanks to Avalanche, and honestly, I don't have much else to say about Frost. He's just good at what he does. I do believe that his crown of being the best defense frame has been taken away in recent years, but he's still Frost. Garuda is up next, and she's a pretty baseline DPS frame. Her entire goal is to build up Blood Ball, then throw it at some schmuck group and blow them to smithereens. If enemies are a bit tankier, then hit 4, then throw Blood Ball. Like many wide-range DPS frames, Garuda has downtimes to limit her damage output from just constantly being out on the field, so in her downtime she's usually putting out her 4, which in of itself is a low-level mob clear that bypasses walls, and also putting down heal fields, which are nice bonuses for the team overall. Because of how nice her 4 is and the damage that she can put out as well as the range she can cover, I have to put her in mid, though I can't put her much higher as her setup time is also pretty long, just like Ash. 
Mirage is next, and she's a frame you play when you're looking to do nothing more than to take the Phantasma and buff it to hell and back and also triple the projectiles. The area becomes a fucking Toho bullet hell for enemies. She's very much a weapon-oriented frame, and it certainly shows. With Hall of Mirrors and Eclipse Light Form, her damage is incredibly high, some of the highest you can reach in the game. She also has a nice, decent CC in the form of her Disco Ball, albeit a bit expensive. She's mainly restricted to mid-tier, though, as her weapon damage output isn't as high as some of the other frames later listed on the list. She does what she does well, though. She's also got some survivability problems. Her only real way of negating damage is with Eclipse, but she must be in the shadows for it to work, and she loses her damage bonus if she does that. But it's hard to deny the damage that she can put out. Next in mid-tier is Necros, and Necros, I feel, is a bit misunderstood. Necros is not just a loot bitch. It's often slept on, but Necros' terrify ability actually reduces enemy armor. And with its augment, you can slow enemies by 90%. That's kind of a big deal. Necros can prevent enemies from harassing any objective while also making them take more damage. He's not just limited to Desecrate, he has CC potential that works well with other parts of his kit. He also has a selection of great augments, and he even has team support thanks to his health and energy orbs. It would be a crime to put him in anything below mid-tier. Next, we have Neja, a frame that was once known as a worse Rhino. But thanks to the rework, Neja is now more of a trade-off version of Rhino, sacrificing some of the offensive team power from Rhino's roar to get a stronger defense game, with warding Halo's team potential and his ability to create health orbs along with a longer-lasting CC. Neja has a solid CC in the form of Divine Spears, an iron skin-like survival tool in the form of warding Halo, and he can even dish out some pretty nasty damage now thanks to his Blazing Chakram augment. He's very much a jack of all trades, and he does these individual roles well. The amount of damage he can put out is pretty damn nice, and he's one of the few frames capable of offering their defensive powers to allies, something Rhino is not able to do with his iron skin. However, Neja is weaker as an individual frame for these compromises. His warding halo can't get as strong as something like iron skin, and while he does have damage potential, he doesn't really have buffing potential. Because this tier list involves comparing other frames, Neja does have to compete with Rhino still, as they still do have some pretty similar kit functions. But thanks to his Rework, Neja has moved from low tier to mid tier. We have two more frames for mid tier, and this next one might be controversial. In fact, a number of you have probably expected this frame to be in low tier. Next up is Voban. Voban has been the talk of needing a rework for a long time, and goddamn do I agree. But for different reasons than some folk might think. See, I think Voban is honestly a good CC frame. He's similar to that of Hydroid in that he's capable of multiple individual instances of CC. Voban is capable of putting down so many Bastilles and Vortexes that nothing will be able to act while Voban is in the area. It makes him great for things like interception, excavation, mobile defense, and the like. My main problem with Voban is that he is boring. There's a lot of frames that rely on mostly just one ability, but in most cases, they do have some other kind of depth to them. Loki is almost entirely valued for his four, but he has his visibility for other playstyles. Mesa is valued for her four, but she does have some CC potential. Voban's entire deal is, he presses three and sometimes four, but they're roughly the same thing. But he does the role so goddamn well, a single Voban can make a number of mission types an absolute joke. But because of how one-dimensional he is, I can't put him much higher. He also suffers from the same issue as Hydroid. His multiple instance of CC is good, but there's other CC frames that don't need to work as hard. So Voban has to put in more effort a lot of the time. But despite that, I wouldn't feel right putting him in low tier, even if he's as boring as a box of rocks. Lastly, in mid, we have Volt. Volt is handy for two things primarily, his shields and his four. I know some might bring up speed, but guys, let's be honest, this is mostly just a gimmick. The attack speed boost is nice though. As mentioned in regards to Atlas, a Volt's shield count is higher and is much more useful in an offensive sense as it allows him and his team to get increased damage out of the deal. His four is also a pretty good damage dealer, although it does result in Volt having to get into the fray to get the most damage, since damage falls off the farther enemies are from Volt. But it also doubles as a decent CC. And yes, Scott, Volt is still CC. He's a rather simple frame, similar to Frost, 
but he also has simple issues. His shields, while good, aren't as good at raw defending as something like Snowglow, especially due to the shield limit count. And you can only get the damage buff of the shields by shooting through the shields, something that I rarely see teammates taking advantage of. Additionally, his four losing its damage to fall off ain't great, and it also falls off pretty quickly as well. Another problem with this 4 is, if recasted on a group still affected by a previous instance of it, they don't get affected again, which is a massive hamper to Volt's game plan. Volt also lacks a good personal survivability tool. He does have his shields, but they pale in comparison to the overall coverage of something like a warding Halo. But for what he does bring to the table, I would say that Volt is worthy of mid-tier. And that is it for part one. As I suspected, this video was going to be quite long by the halfway point, so we'll save the rest for next time. In the meantime, if you feel like I was too harsh or too generous with placements, let me know and I'll take the thoughts into account. But for now, I'm going back to wait for a mainline update. <laughs> In a year now? Uh, hey, uh, you still here? If you are, you probably noticed that a frame is missing from the rankings. One that you would assume to be in something like mid or low? Yeah, uh, Mag wasn't in this part. Truth is, I don't know where to put her. Likely in mid, but I've not played enough to get a good grasp on her, so... Yeah. Okay, you can go now.